All right, good evening, folks. I want to welcome everybody to our April 23rd, 2019 Cape Elizabeth Zoning Board of Appeals meeting. Uh, we have, a, a, I think, just one housekeeping item to take care of before we move on to the more substantive business this evening. Uh, first and foremost, um, we will uh, address the minutes from the February 26th, 2019 meeting. I was unable to be here. Uh, any questions from the members of the board uh, relative to those draft minutes? Any clarifications? No. I would then like to entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the February 26, 2019 meeting. So moved. So moved by Kevin. Do we have a second? Second. By Michael. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of approval of the minutes? All opposed? We've got four uh, in favor and one abstention, and one abstention, which is me, because I wasn't here. All right, on to old business, which was uh, a matter that was tabled from the October 23rd, 2018 meeting. Um, purpose of, of this is to hear the request of Kent Showmaker, owner of the property at 600 Preble Street, map U2, lot 5, to expand a non-conforming single-family dwelling by adding a roof deck based on section 19-4-3.B.4 of the zoning ordinance. Our code enforcement officer, Ben McDougall, can perhaps offer us a few points of information on this. Sure. Uh, most of you heard this back in October. Uh, the application was lacking some information in order for the zoning board to make a decision on it. So the applicant is coming back with the added information that the zoning board requested, mostly the uh, accurate elevation drawings of what the deck would look like from adjacent properties. Right. We will then uh, open this up for a presentation by the applicant, by Mr. Showmaker. Is My first question is, is it Showmaker or Shoemaker? Showmaker, okay, very good. Good evening. So I, I am uh, representing this application from October, um, mostly because there was insufficient information on the previous meeting for you to come to a decision. We have included with this application uh, construction plans, um, as well as um, uh, the uh, boundary survey. <clears throat> the basic premise is that the house has a closed in four season deck. It was originally built in 1924 and slowly over the decades the porch was closed in. It was not done well and so what we hope to do is reconstruct that room as a portion of this project, we'd like to put a flat roof onto the newly reconstructed room, um, <clears throat> which will allow us to have a deck that which, which would be accessed from the second floor. I think there were some concerns about privacy issues at the past meeting, so as you can see on the construction plans, we've added some privacy panels. There are also some additional photographs I hope that will allow you to see our relationship to uh, our neighbors. Mr. Chairman, can you walk us through some of the photographs? I'm not really getting it where they're being uh, taken from. your photographs are in the same order that mine are. Um, the first two photographs show uh, from the Crescent Street side, show the house as it exists at the moment, first on uh, the left-hand side and the second one on the right-hand side. So the first one would be the side bordering uh, Mr. Mainville's property and the second one would be on the side bordering the Dadman's property. <coughs> The third photograph shows a picture from the roof as it exists. It shows the corner of the house and shows what can be visualized on the Dadman side. Uh, then there's a photograph 
from essentially Crescent Street uh, that shows the three houses uh, together and as they currently exist. And then the last photograph uh, shows the edge of the house and what can be seen from the edge of the roof um, on the Mainville side. And I think the, hopefully the construction plans will answer or will show you what exists at the moment and what we propose. Further questions for Mr. Showmaker? Good. Hearing none. Thank you. And uh, Ben, did we receive any, any commentary via email? No, we didn't. Okay. And I would then open uh, the floor up for any public comment from anybody who uh, wishes to comment on this particular application. Uh, the, the question was if it, whether it was possible to see a copy of the elevation of the drawings. Additional questions or comments from the gallery? Okay, hearing, hearing none, we'll go ahead and close the public comment portion of this meeting and I suspect we might reserve an opportunity for the gentleman who's just now looking at the plans to make a comment if he, cho if he chooses to. Um, in the meantime, I'd invite the board's input on the application. Bill Sam, happy that I think he, uh, the applicant, uh, definitely went back into this whole work and, and had a nice design put together. And I'm glad he's back before the board. Um, I'm a little concerned with the impact of views from with the addition of those privacy panels. Uh, certainly, so nobody would be able to see onto the new deck. But I'm not sure, and I guess there's no way to find out if, if uh, that. Looking at the back of the house, the, the butter to the right, um, I'm not sure if that would impact any views that they might have beyond that they would have now. I'm not sure what, what, what is in that direction, but if we don't have anybody here to say, just putting just put it out there. I guess my comment would be from the, the pictures that looks like there's not going to be any any great impact on views but but I agree with what you have to say which is there's nobody here to to raise that issue um, difficult for us to to conclude that there would be a, a detrimental impact on any uh, butters properties views there are comments or thoughts from the board the board um, I don't really have any comments. I mean, I, I think I might have been the one to suggest tabling it uh, before to, to get some additional information. I just I want to thank Mr. Showmaker for coming and, and doing this. I, these plans are, are helpful to me. Um, uh, you know, part of what we're trying to do here is, uh, I think, allow people to make reasonable accommodations to homes that were not built with the current zoning <laughs> code uh, in mind. And, and to me, this um, this falls into the category of, of reasonableness on that. So that's my two cents. Any further comments? Uh, Kevin, I agree with you. I think this is, I think this is very, uh, seems to be a reasonable request. I think the additional information and photographs we received are helpful. So thank you, Mr. Showmaker, for, for that. Uh, and I would entertain a motion 
then uh, any motion the board wants to make, but it sounds as though the motion is uh, in fact to approve the request of Kent Showmaker, owner of the property at 600 Pebble Street, map U2, lot five, to expand a non-conforming single family dwelling by adding a roof deck based on section 19-4-3.B.4 of the zoning ordinance. Did you make that motion? I did not. <laughs> I will make that motion. Word so moved. Word. So moved by Kevin. Very good. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Okay. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, the motion is now open for discussion. Any further discussion? Can I, can I just ask uh, one clarification of the code enforcement officer? This this approval, um, and maybe we make this a condition or an additional finding of fact, but um, does that then tie this plan into being what's approved so that it's a requirement that those privacy fences be built as part of this? Yes. Okay. Great. That was my only point. Thanks. Okay. Any further discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor of the pending motion? All opposed, that is unanimous. The motion carries. We'll move on to the proposed findings of fact. Uh, proposed finding of fact one, the property is a non-conforming lot in the RC zone. There is an existing single family dwelling on the property. Proposed additional findings of fact one, the Zoning Board of Appeals has considered the size of the lot, the slope of the land, the potential for soil erosion, the location of other structures on the property and on adjacent properties, the impact on views and the type and amount of vegetation to be removed to accomplish the relocation. <coughs> proposed additional finding of fact two, the proposed structure will not increase the nonconformity of the existing structure. And proposed additional finding of fact three, the proposed structure is in compliance with the setback requirement to the greatest practical extent. Yeah, I just want to. I just want to make the point. We've we've had this. Um, I've made this point in the past as well. We're reviewing this under section 19-4-3. Uh, dot B dot four, which is non-conforming buildings or structures. And the reference in finding effect number one is to a non-conforming lot, which it very it it probably is. I mean, very, very it's not uncommon for a lot of these projects to have both a non-conforming lot and a non-conforming structure. But uh, I think we should at least add uh, to finding effect one that this is a non-conforming structure. There, uh, so uh, the, if we revise proposed finding one, there is an existing single family dwelling on the property, comma, which is a non-conforming structure. Yeah, sounds reasonable. Okay. Any other thoughts on the proposed findings? Chair, I, just looking at number four, we have that down there, but on the earlier, uh, on, on the minutes that we approved, there's an example where we say that the applicant has demonstrated compliance with the requirements of this particular section. And in that section, uh, on my code, it's page 47. And the first phrase is any con non conforming structure. So that also covers the other point that Mike made. So uh, the additional finding then would be a uh, proposed additional finding of fact four. The applicant has demonstrated compliance with section 19 4 3.b.4 of the zoning ordinance. Yes. Okay. We had it as uh, demonstrate compliance with the requirements in that section. Compliance with the requirements. Yeah, it's demonstrated compliance with the requirements in the section. Set forth within section 19-4-3.b.4 of the zoning ordinance. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> Anything else, gentlemen? All right, so I would enter a 
entertain a motion to approve the proposed finding of fact and proposed additional findings of fact as, uh, as amended. So moved. Further discussion? All in favor? It's unanimous, the motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Showmaker. Mr. Chair, just a quick point of order yes. on the next item on the agenda. I just would want the record to reflect that I am uh, the owner of Lot 51 um, in this. I don't have any conflicts and don't feel any need to recuse myself from discussion on this, but I did want to just note that for the record. Very good. Thank you. That does bring us to, to uh, on our agenda, Section D, New Business, um, Agenda Item 2. To hear the request of Robert Barrett representing the property owners John and Sarah Brownell at 6 Spoondrift Lane, map U36, lot 41, to expand a non conforming single family dwelling by adding story over a portion of the existing house based on section 19 4 3.b.4 of the zoning ordinance. And, uh, ben, if you could offer us a quick summary. Sure, uh, a representative from Barrett Made, a local builder, contacted me several weeks ago about doing an addition at this property, uh, going straight up on the existing footprint, but a small portion of that building footprint is uh, does not meet the uh, current setback requirement of 25 feet to the front. Uh, therefore, they need a zoning board approval to expand upward on that small portion of the house. Okay. Thank you. We'll open the floor then to uh, Mr. Barrett and to John and Sarah Brownell. And just like Ben said, we're basically just adding a story on an existing footprint of the house, uh, mainly over the garage, tying in to the the house on the first floor as well as the second floor for a master suite addition. May I ask a question, Mr. Chair? Oh, absolutely. Sure. Uh, is, is this uh, house on the public sewer system? It is. Okay. Yeah. So there's, there's no on site wastewater disposal? Right. There are no septic systems. Thanks. Because there is an additional bedroom, right? There as, is. As a result yeah, of exactly. it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Other questions for the applicant? Right. Okay. Nothing further. We will be sure to call, call you back up if we have additional questions for you. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Barrett. Did we, did we receive any submissions from uh, the public? We did. We, uh, we received a letter from Gerald and Elizabeth uh, Milroy. And they are in support of the application. They live across the street at uh, five Spoon Drift Lane. With that, we'll go ahead and open this up for uh, comments or questions from uh, members of the public. Any comments or questions about this particular application? Feel free to step forward. All right, hearing none, we will close the public portion of the meeting and move uh, forward with board consideration. Um, Mike already asked the, you know, I think the question that, uh, uh, you know, regarding the extra bedroom, that was really the only 
I think open question I had doesn't seem that views are, are really an issue here. Um, storm water uh, shouldn't be affected by this, so I don't have a problem with this. I agree. We don't seem to have any issues with any of the criteria set forth in the ordinance, um, particularly in, in light of the, the the neighbor's commentary in favor of the uh, in favor of the project. Doesn't seem like it would impact uh, uh, views from what I can see from what's submitted and clearly from the neighbor's comments. Very good. You heard it here first. <laughs> We're live. <laughs> Any other comments, questions, thoughts from, from the board on this application? Okay. Well, then, uh, I, I think the motion then will be, folks can tell me if I'm right, to approve the request of Robert Barrett, representing the property owners, John and Sarah Brownell, at 6 Spoon Drift Lane, map U36, lot 41, to expand a non-conforming single-family dwelling by adding a story over a portion of the existing house based on section 19-4-3.B.4 of the zoning ordinance. I would entertain that motion if any board member cares to make the same. So moved. All right. Thank you, Michael. We have a second. Second. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Chair, sure, I have a question for the order. Yes. What you just read is slightly different than the, the text on my piece of paper. You inserted the owner's name for ease of reference. I, I did reference the owner's name. You did. Yes. My yeah. version does not have that. He. I think. Um, I think the chair read the notice language and not the findings of fact language okay. that was on here. There's a slight difference between the two. Think we're pro probably all comfortable with having the, the owner's names in there? Yeah, I think that okay. probably Thank makes you. the most sense. All right. All right, so we had, um, it was moved. We've got a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of the pending motion. Approved unanimously. Move on to uh, findings of fact. Excellent, thank you. Uh, proposed finding of fact one. The property is a non-conforming lot in the RA zone. There is an existing single family dwelling on the property. I think, Karma. well, but I think it's actually, I don't think it's a non-conforming lot. I think it's only the structure here that's non-conforming. We might get a... No, the lot is also non The lot is non-conforming also? Okay, yeah, so, yep. both. Okay. So I'm, I'll just reread that. Proposed finding of fact one, the property is a non-conforming lot in the RA zone. There's an existing single family dwelling on the property. And Ben has suggested adding comma which is a non-conforming structure. Great. Additional finding, a proposed additional finding of fact one. The Zoning Board of Appeals has considered the size of the lot, the slope of the land, the potential for soil erosion, the location of other structures on the property and on adjacent properties, the impact on views, and the type and amount of vegetation to be removed to accomplish the relocation. Proposed additional finding of fact two. The proposed structure will not increase the non-conformity of the existing structure. Proposed additional finding of fact three, the proposed structure is in compliance with the setback requirement to the greatest practical extent. And proposed additional finding of fact four, uh, again suggested by, by Ben McDougall, the applicant has demonstrated compliance with the requirements set forth within section 19-4-3.B.4 of the ordinance. Thoughts or questions about the proposed findings as just read? Would 
entertain a motion to approve the proposed finding of fact and proposed additional findings of fact. So moved. Thank you. Uh, is there a second? Michael, thank you. Any further discussion? All in favor? It's unanimous. Motion carries. Granted our approval. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. Onto our final item of uh, new business. Uh, to hear the administrative appeal of Yam Yams LLC, Michael Friedland, manager, regarding the code enforcement officer's determination that his proposal for the property at 287 Ocean House Road, map U22, lot 76, requires a site plan review from the planning board prior to receiving other permits and commencing operation. Uh, ben, if you could offer us a summary. On, uh, on January 22nd is the first time I spoke with Mr. Friedland. Uh, I explained to him that he would need a site plan review. Uh, subsequently, a week or so later, met with myself and the town planner, and uh, we discussed uh, the process. Mr. Friedland then applied to the planning board, uh, got on the agenda for a workshop, and and then uh, his attorney uh, sent a letter to the town planner, Maureen O'Meara, uh, presenting an argument that he wouldn't need to be on the planning board agenda. Uh, Mr. Friedland then requested to be removed from the planning board agenda. And uh, Maureen O'Meara, our town planner, uh, sent his attorney's letter to our attorney for, for a, a legal decision from our attorney, and you've seen that in our file. And that's basically what brings us here today, and then they requested a formal decision from me, which I uh, cited the town attorney's letter. Uh, one thing I would point out is that I, I didn't have uh, Mr. Friedland's business plan when I, when I made my decision, and there are, there are a couple new things in that business plan that I wasn't aware of, one, one being the solar panels, uh, which, which is an exterior change on the building. Uh, we did have a project uh, three years ago where someone changed the siding slightly on, on their structure, and they were required to go to the planning board for a, a slight change in the finish on their siding. Uh, so solar panels are an exterior change that I, that I think would, would trigger a site plan amendment. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the proposed use, uh, Mr. Friedland expanded on the proposed uses a little bit. Uh, he, he talks about having classes there and you know creating different things there, which it muddies the water a little bit from a use perspective. It, uh, you know, depending on the intensity of those uses, it, it could push it towards cottage industry manufacturing. It um, it could push it towards an educational use. So those those couple points that I wasn't aware of uh, muddy the water a little bit. I wasn't privy to that information when I made my decision. Thank you. Turn the. Uh Dias over to uh, the applicant, uh, Attorney Balger and Mr. Friedland. Thank you. 
exhibits that we have in front of you include the uh, photograph of the existing property for members of the public. This is what you see. What you can see here is what will be the building has changed, and I will put that uh, photo up on the easel in just a moment. I'm going to introduce Michael Friedland, who is going to talk about his plans for the lumbery in detail. I think that's important. Um, I think when, when he's finished, it'll be clear what his use is. Uh, also, it'll be clear as to what improvements that Mr. Friedland is making to the structure. And then uh, my portion of the presentation will be uh, the legal arguments concerning interpretation of the ordinance, or more likely what's literally in the ordinance and what isn't. So, Mike. Hi, thanks. Thanks. Uh, just thank you to the Zoning Board of Appeals and for everyone that's come out here tonight. Uh, my name is Mike Friedland, and I'm under contract to purchase 287 Ocean House Road, the old Cumbies. And uh, I've got this great speech that I worked on for two days, and I'm, I'm probably going to scrap it a little bit. Um, but my, pr my primary goal is, is to create a business that enhances the community, helps the environment, and and improves the lot. Right now it's a vacant lot. It's been vacant for over five and a half years and Paul will go over that as well. There are restrictions in the deed that Cumbies put on the lot when they moved. And then there are limitations on the town what you could do. So it's very limiting what you could even have on that lot. And um, so let me get to what I'm going to do on the lot. I'm not going to change the building. and. I was going to put solar panels on there, which I thought would be great, but if it triggers site plan review, then I won't have solar panels. And I was going to have courses there that I thought would enhance the community, but if having courses that help the community triggers site plan review, I don't need to have courses. The, the main goal of my business, it's a mini boutique hipster-esque lumberyard. And I use that term because it's the new model of how consumers are these days. They want to know that they get a quality product. They want someone friendly there helping them. They want to know the consequences of their choices. They want to know where the wood came from, how it got there. Um, an example is that I was at Lowe's the other day and the pile of wood says Idaho Forest Group. And I, I thought it was like a name like Bangor Savings Bank in Portland, but it's Idaho. The, we live in the Pine Tree State, and there's wood at Lowe's that comes from Idaho. And it's crazy. So the more I'm learning, so my original business model was that I was going to move my Willard Square home repair business there because I've got a van and a truck, so I need parking for two spaces. And this lot seemed like a great lot. And part of my business is that we stock wood so that we don't have to drive a half hour to get one piece of wood from Home Depot and back. And I was thinking, if we're at this lot and we're stocking wood, we should just sell our wood to the people of Cape Elizabeth. It's just sort of a common sense. And then I'm thinking, I, it seems like the more research I do, that it's really encouraged to buy local, buy from local mills that are in Maine that preach responsible uh, foresting, responsible harvesting. The wood stays in Maine and it benefits local communities and it's not being shipped three states over to a processing plant just to be brought back to Maine. So I went from just wanting a couple of parking spaces to wanting to sell the wood that I'm going to have anyway to I might as well help the environment. And then while I'm there in this space, I want to help the community. So I, want, I was thinking people would come in and I'd educate them on the wood. We're going to offer cutting, which they don't do at Home Depot. If someone's local, we'll deliver it, because not everyone has a truck. Uh, we're going to keep everything inside the building. It's, we're not going to make much noise. We're not doing that much cutting. And, it's just, it's, and we're going to bring life to an empty lot. And if you guys give me a couple more minutes, because I've been doing tons of research and practice. 
Um, but there was an article from 2013, so five and a half years ago. And the article is titled, Cape Center Landscape Changes in Wake of Jonesy's Key Bank Closures. So it's five and a half years ago. The lot's been vacant for five and a half years. Uh, it goes on to say, in addition to being down to just one gas station and losing its last bank, Cape also has in recent years lost its last hardware store and its last locally owned pharmacy. People are buying and shopping differently, said McGovern, who was the town manager at the time. We have a town center committee, and I think it needs to look at the issues of what a small town like Cape Elizabeth can do with all these changes in society, which I feel reflects my business very well. Uh, he goes on to say, the task of the town center committee is to understand those national trends, understand how they impact Cape Elizabeth, and then figure out what do you want Cape Elizabeth to be in the context of those national trends. And I mean, to, to spell it out is that the national trends are small businesses, changing traditional business models, and um, it's just there's a new movement of people getting their hands dirty. Um, micro roasteries, micro breweries, gourmet cheeses. It's like all these old world practices are coming back and, and I want to be part of that. I'm, I'm super excited to be part of it. Um, and then I read the town center plan because if the town center plan said we don't want me there, that, that would be a clear statement. And this statement from the town center plan was, I thought was pretty relevant. It says, the committee acknowledges that many of the properties in the town center are privately owned. As a result, the town must sometimes react to the decisions of private property owners and cannot dictate the disposition of private property that otherwise complies with town regulations. I, I think that's pretty huge. Um, so, um, let me try and wrap this up quickly. Sorry, I had a couple of thoughts right there that they, they, they really just disappeared. Um, maybe I'll come back to it later on. You're, you're welcome to come back to those after Attorney Bulger's presentation. Okay. And, 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 and I, I just do want to mention that, that what we as a board are really focused on, the crux here, the nub of this whole yeah. issue, is not whether this is a good idea, right. but whether this needs to go through site plan review. Yes per the language of the yes. ordinance. And so that's, that's what, what we're really going to focus and, on here tonight, just so everybody understands. I, I also really want to make it clear that I, I'm not trying to subvert the process. I went through site plan review with my office building, so I realized what's required. And upon reading the code, it states clearly, if you're not changing the building, you're not changing the lot, and you're going to a lesser use, you do not need site plan review. It's, it, I mean, everyone who's read it, I can say, read this, and they'll come to the same conclusion I came to, that it does not need site plan review. And and if having solar panels and classes triggers site plan review, I will get rid of those. Uh, I've been through site plan review, it's expensive. I'm a small business. I, I don't have loads of dollars to get this business, to, to put life into this lot. I, I really want this to happen, I think it'd be awesome. And furthermore, I, I am of this community. I forgot to mention that. I, I've been in Willard for over 20 years. I own property in Cape, I work in Cape, I run in Robinson's Woods, I paddle the Spurwink, I surf at Pond Cove. I, I mean, I am Cape. I mean, my kids, they, they played Cape schools their whole lives. It's like, this, this is my community. So it means a lot to me. I would not do anything adversely to the community. And I really want this to happen. I think it'll be great. The, there's just empty lots and, and I could fill one with some good stuff, so. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Paul Bolger. Good evening to the board, Mr. Chairman and Mr. McDougall. You have a detailed opinion from my office that followed on the heels of an exchange with Maureen and Mr. McDougall and then with John Wall as described by Mr. McDougall. Um, I want to tell you what my, some of my own history with the property. I was involved in the purchase by uh, Jin Wong, who purchased it ostensibly for the use as a, a dental office building, but decided not to not to go forward. He's now represented by other counsel. 
But at the time of his acquisition, uh, the property had a very low price in relative terms, and I knew the property well, having lived in Cape Elizabeth and using this uh, particular site as a milepost for everything. You know, if you want to go to the dump, you go to the Cumberland Farms and fill up with gas and then go down Scott Dyer Road and, and uh, maybe, maybe even meet uh, a famous politician dumping trash with you, um, as I have. But anyway, I negotiated uh, the restrictions with Cumberland Farms, and as you might imagine, um, they can do whatever they want, pretty much, and they did. So this property is restricted. Um, there is not to be any competition with their store across the street. No gasoline, no convenience food, no fast food, no schools, no nurseries, no churches, anything where children are involved because of potential uh, petrochemical exposure. Um, so they don't want competition and they don't want uh, exposure and they have a they went through the VRAP process with DEP so they got a clean bill of health and they did 41 test pits on the site they removed the tanks appropriately all that stuff and they applied to the town five years ago to remove their canopies and those canopies were removed by permit and that will be important so I want to uh, go beyond that particular transaction and my inability to, you know, perhaps lessen the restrictions on the property that affect its marketability and uses. So what is it useful for? Uh, maybe fine dining, because that doesn't compete with the store across the street. And maybe a professional office, or definitely professional offices. But don't bring any children. So that's not a criticism, of, a criticism of Cumberland Farms, by the way. It took me six months to get there, which was like, no, <laughs> you're, you're not going to get any better than this. We do this to every store that we sell. Um, and I had a good relationship with them at the end. So having said that and focusing on this application, a little bit of history. Um, Mr. McDougal gave, uh, mentioned the initial meeting January 22nd. There were some follow-up meetings in exchange of emails. Follow-up meetings on February 5th and February 21st led to this back and forth about where in the ordinance, as Michael was saying to uh, Maureen O'Meara, the planner, he said, where in the ordinance are you talking about? Out of frustration, and, and she said, well, you're, uh, you, you're doing a change of use, and that change of use is a lesser intensive use under a very detailed ordinance provision for village retail. So you're not gas convenience store with all the traffic. You're village retail, this quiet, sleepy little thing that Michael described. And that's what he is. I mean, it's, it's just like you know, stripes on a zebra, that's, he's village retail. So, and Michael says, so what is it that I'm doing with my change of use, this uh, less intensive use that's so objectionable? She said, well, there's an existing site plan and you, the canopies are being removed. Canopies uh, have to be removed and therefore our plan needs to change, therefore, you need to go through site plan review. That's external, it affects traffic. It's a major component of traffic. And Michael said, gosh, that doesn't make any sense to me. I better go consult council. So that's when I had the exchange. So that's the, that's the more comprehensive view of this back and forth that Ben described. Fair enough. So the issue then is, is this does this application really require site plan review. Now, this is the Zoning Board of Appeals. So what you're doing is looking at the ordinance and applying it as law, like any statute. What does the Planning Board do under site plan review? You all probably know, but the public may not really have an idea of this. They're looking at things like traffic and drainage 
and buffering, light, noise that affect neighbors, and where are your structures going on the lot? That's it. How is this use affecting the community where it's going? When I apply all of that, and I look at this use, the projected use, versus this use, Michael is going to paint this, he's going to replace this roof, which is falling apart, he will replace these windows, and that window, that window, that window. The planes of the building are the same. And he likes to put solar panels on, as he's described. And how that affects drainage, traffic, buffering, lighting, noise, is a mystery. So if you went for site plan review, what would you be, what data would I submit? What would you an eagle eye view of this? Here is, from 1994, the existing conditions plan used in site plan review by Cumberland Farms. They were installing these canopies for these gas islands. That's it. They didn't have them originally in the early 80s when they got approved. So they had to go in and add these. And oh, by the way, they expanded their hours so they could stay open until 11 or midnight or whatever it was. So the use that was there Convenience store gas island day, night, and into the night was approved by the planning board. And they attached some conditions and they made them come back and all that stuff, which is part of their public purpose. And that's understandable. But here it is the existing building. Guess what we're going to have? The existing building. There aren't any canopies, they're gone. And Mr. McDougall and or his predecessor, I don't know who issued the permit for it, removal of those canopies, which I accept would affect sight lines and traffic through this, but which do not anymore. What would I do if I had Michael come in to the planning board and he's going to say, I'm here, I'm here to present my plan, here's my existing conditions plan. Oh, by the way, here's my new plan. What? I've been practicing law for 35 years, and I lived in this town, and I've been before this board, and I've been before the planning board. And I don't get it. I feel stupid. I cannot, it does not compute. So let's go to the ordinance. That's where the law is. The law, this is an interpretation of you. I don't need any interpretation because the Cape Elizabeth Code is excellent on these points. It's, it's some of the clearest language available to me as a practicing lawyer. I get into these disputes with code enforcement officers all the time, and I'm telling you, it can be hard stuff. This is not one of those. My first argument against site plan review is that this is de clearly de minimis. De minimis for purposes of site plan review is defined under 19-9-6 subparagraph B of the ordinance. That's 19-9-6B cited in Mr. Wall's opinion letter. He says de minimis change is generally described as quote, a minor deviation from the approved plan. What is our approved plan? There it is. What's our change of plan? There it is. Oh my God, it's the same thing. Ergo, it's de minimis. <laughs> well, it seems logical to me. I submit that the proposal is the very definition the very essence of minor deviation. I don't know how this affects traffic. I don't know how it affects lighting, buffering, or drainage. I would have to get pretty creative. So 
Let's say that there is some change, maybe in that roof replacement, maybe in those windows, there's something that affects the public, in, uh, upgrading the windows, that is. My submission states, with respect to this proposal, that the town's file already includes the existing conditions plan, survey, description of the building, building footprint, lighting, traffic access, stormwater, drainage plan, and topographical map with contour lines. And this plan, by the way, shows where that drainage goes at the back of the building in a drainage trench. So I don't know what we would change that hadn't already been approved by the planning board. I've already been through the other portion, that is, that this is a less intensive use and therefore exempt because it's in the town center zone, which expressly exempts the village retail, which is a lesser intensive use. That is, we're going from a gas station store use to category 6, 19-6-4, E, 2, and 3, to Village retail use and by definition less intensive. See page 105 of the ordinance. Surprisingly, Mr. Wall concludes, and that becomes the basis for the decision by Mr. McDougall, that the removal of canopies is a material change which vacates the exemption. I've already said the canopies don't exist. They were lawfully removed. What is it about canopies that don't exist that we have to come in and explain to the planning board how we're removing canopies? We can walk out to the street, see that there aren't any canopies on the site, and oh, by the way, they don't, inf they don't affect uh, traffic sight lines either, because they don't exist. So I concluded, and I, and I state this in my written argument, page five, that the town must have issued a permit because they were de minimis at the time. That is, you're removing the canopies, so you don't need to amend the site plan. Most people don't amend a site plan when they're removing stuff. So if that applied to Cumberland Farms, why does it apply to us? We're not changing anything else, but we don't have any canopies to remove. Secondly, And most importantly, the plain language of the ordinance itself expressly exempts a conversion under these circumstances. 19-6-4E3, page one of the 105 of the ordinance provides, the following uses and activities shall, mandatory language, shall be subject to site plan review by the planning board. And then skipping down, unless, one, the current use category receives site plan approval. Current use category is Cumberland Farms. We have their plan. It's been approved, not once, twice, three times, because they amended it. So we have an, a plan for the existing use, that is a gas station convenience store. The second use, or the use is less intensive, there will be no, and three, there will be no exterior alterations other than signage. And four, no multi-family multi dwelling units, rooming house, or bed and breakfast, obviously not. So the question is, do we meet those requirements? I submit that we do. This is a site of an existing structure not to be changed except on its existing planes, front, roof, Two, the use is less intensive per the ordinance. I didn't make this stuff up. The project three, the project has already been subject to site plan review several times. And four, the exterior alterations will be limited to signage. I would hope that upon application for his permits that Mike Friedland could be allowed to install his panels for power. So, 
Um, as I argue, we submit that the decision of the code enforcement officer be reversed um, for the reasons that I've stated. Uh, this is a village retail use. There's no manufacturing. It's interior to the store. There's not, there is, although it's been referred to as a lumber yard in places, all storage is within the, in, within the store itself. It is not going to be lumber storage outside. This is specialty lumber, specialty tools, and an occasional cutting as when, let's say, a single mother or a widow or, let's say, not so handy handyman wants crown molding in his house, he knows where to get it. Anyway, I, I don't mean to sound, uh, how should I say, impatient. Um, I seldom get an ordinance that's so well written, that, that does and says what it means. And the Zoning Board of Appeals, I, I seldom want to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals. It means I have gotten my rear end kicked around down below. But I want to say this, I just want the law to be applied. Thank you. Questions for Attorney Bulger and Mr. Friedland from the board. I'm probably gonna have some, but I think maybe in the interest of time, we should go through some public comment first, uh, because I have a feeling as we discuss this, we might continue to have some questions. Uh, that would be my suggestion. I don't know how others is, feel. Is the board comfortable with that? Sure. Sure. Yes. Uh, I, I was just standing up wondering if there are questions for me. Yeah. But not at the moment, it sounds like. We'll, we'll get back to you, I'm, I am sure. Thank I'm certain. Uh, I know that there were a number of email submissions that were made to, to Ben McDougall's office, and I believe all those have been incorporated as part of the record. Is that right? Yeah, I, I haven't had time to print all of them today and make them formally part of the record, but they've all been forwarded to you? Yes. Okay. And just for the public's information, there were, I don't know, nine, 10, or 12 of them that kind of falling, falling all over the spectrum as far as whether this is appropriate or not. Um, but those will be included ultimately with the, with the record of this hearing. Uh, with that, we'll go ahead and, and open this up for comment from the public. Now, I just want to remind everybody of, of a point that I mentioned earlier, and that is we are not here to debate the, the ultimate wisdom of, of this occurring across the diagonal to us across the street. Um, our sole purpose as a board tonight is to determine whether this should go through site plan review or whether it should not. So does it go to the planning board per the language of the ordinance or does it not need to do that? So that's really the only issue that we as a zoning board can consider here tonight. So I would just ask that, the, that to the extent there is public comment, but please do your best to, to, to uh, stick with that, with that line of thought uh, with any of your presentations. So with that, I'd invite any members of the public to the, to the podium with questions or comments. And anybody who does have any, anything to say, please just uh, do state your name at, at the mic for the record. Paul Seidman, uh, K President. Thank you. Um, I learned about the, uh, the proposal and um, and then learned that there was this, you know, this possible uh, obstacle. And um, but especially given what I've heard tonight, which is more information than I had before, um, you know, it just sounds like a, a good fit and an appropriate use of the space. And so I'm just here to en encourage you to support the project. Thanks. Thank you. Howard Cheney, 27 Murray Drive. Um, again, I can't talk to uh, the zoning regs and, and all the specifics here. I just wanted to uh, vouch for Michael and uh, 
you know, more of his integrity and reputation. I've worked with him a couple times in his current business. Uh, he's very attentive to detail. He sticks to his commitments. Um, he does what he says he's going to do, so I know he'll work very well with what, whatever decisions uh, the town board and the, and the planning boards come up with. Thanks. Thank you. Andy Landis, 52 Stonegate. Um, I have not read the ordinance. Um, I understand that that's your charge today. But what I did hear today, which I thought was really uh, important, is that we've got two sites, and the Cumbie site in particular, that have sat vacant for five and a half years or so. And we've got um, one dentist that couldn't get this to work. And now we've got another potential person coming to our community who wants to help our community. And to make it more expensive for that person and tougher for that person is not, um, uh, we don't want to frighten people away from bringing business to Cape Elizabeth. Thank you. Hello, my name is Victoria Valent, Cottage Farms Road. Um, and this is, as you mentioned, not a discussion about the use of the property. It's not about what we want, anybody else wants, whether this is going to be quiet and sleepy, whether it's going to cater to single women or widows or the, even the integrity of the applicant. What this here is to discuss, does this go to site plan review? And I'd like to express my support that the code enforcement officer's decision is correct. Because I agree, this is not a de minimis change. Um, we heard the attorney's, uh, applicant's attorney describe a de minimis change. However, he left out part of the description. Because as you know, and as he said, it's a minor deviation from the approved plan. That typically um, arises as a project moves from conception, conception would be where we are, to completion of the construction. So the plan is Cumberland Farms plan. So we're looking at a minor deviation from the approved plan, the approved plan was Cumberland Farms, that can occur from conception to completion. So any de minimis change occurred during this portion of the Cumberland Farms project. And it's true, sometimes projects are approved by the board and then things, slight things do come up. So this is not, this bringing a brand new application forward is not a de minimis change. This is brand new. This is not the approved plan going from conception to completion. That's a done deal. So this does not, this is not a de minimis change. And I disagree with the applicant regarding the conversion of the existing building. Um, the test site for the site plan includes exterior alterations, um, such as he did mention the solar panels. Um, I know he was pleading, I really want to do that. But it, it is a, it's a change, it's another change. So um, also he says the current use category is, um, is the gas station. But I could almost argue that the current use for five and a half years has been an abandoned building. And so I also throw that out. Now site plan approval is, is certainly necessary given the many changes just to the ordinance since 1984. For example, the council did adopt the town center plan. Uh, the town council has approved many changes to the ordinance regarding site plan review since 1984. And amendments reflect changes to uh, bring it up to codes, to recent codes. Because site plan review looks at um, important information like when Cumbies was cited by that planning board, there was no housing in the back as there is now. And a uh, planning board would certainly require much more intensive uh, requirements regarding buffering, around noise, um, I mean, the saws. I, I've talked to people and they're very concerned. I know it's just occasionally when that single woman or widow comes by asking for, you know, some lumber to be cut, but there's concern about that. And the site and the planning board would have made sure that there was buffering for noise. 
um, and because of the new abutters. Also lighting. At one point there was nobody back there. Now there are people back there. Do these current lights have cutoff features so that the light now does not shine into people's bedrooms? So there are a lot of things that have changed since this was site planned in 1984 and the standards that are now adopted by this town through the comprehensive plan to the council and then put into the ordinance. Also, you um, asked um, how this new business affects site plan review and um, besides the, there also was like the traffic patterns. So when you took out those canopies, uh, there was a flow for the traffic as you can picture when you drive up into the gas station. Everyone knows where they're going. Well, this, this site has changed and now you're gonna have people there that I don't, I haven't seen the parking plan. I, I don't know if that parking plan still is acceptable for this parking plan. Also, um, this whole argument about children shouldn't be on site. Um, the applicant is offering classes to pre-K students to come in and learn, so let's just stay focused. The focus is, should this go to site plan review? And it, yes, because this is not a de minimis change, and there are so many standards that have changed since 1984. It's been, we got new abutters, and it's very, very important that it go to that. And so I do ask the board to please support the code enforcement officer. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Doug Jones. Um, so when you did a permit without site plan review, effectively, I mean, that's the underpinning of the entire board, right? So if you start to pick and choose who's gonna have site plan review, um, you know, we just had a deck that came through, our, you know, the next owner is gonna have to go to site plan review even for that permit, because every time you're issuing a permit, um, you're effectively creating a precedent. And the precedent on this site was that that was not an issue. And once you get past that, you, you're reversing yourself as sending an issue to, you know, you're effectively, that, I would not be surprised to see that property get labeled as a problem property. Um, because site plan review is expensive. VRAPs uh, attached to a property, if anyone in this room is familiar with that, is um, not an easy, topic unless you're a gas station which cannot go in there. So by reversing precedent on this, I think you're gonna run into some problems long term and I think it's gonna be something that you deal with as a board for a long time. Just a moment. Scoptress, Eight Woods Knoll Drive, first time I've ever been anything like this before, but uh, I heard the comments of the board. I think you should just do what you said you were gonna do. It appears that the law is the law. Interpret the law the way it's always been interpreted, and I think everybody will be set. Um, I have done business with this company before. I'm 50-50, once it was a good job, once it was a bad job, but after the bad job, he fixed that. So he's an outstanding guy and a good business person, but. You know, look at the law, apply it consistently, and I know sometimes it doesn't make everybody happy, but that's all I ask you to do. Thank you. Further public comment or questions? Hearing none, we will go ahead and close the public comment portion of the meeting. Uh, Mr. Friedland, I know that you had another point that you wanted to make, and I'm just, I'm just mindful that you guys have had your say, and I want to give you the opportunity to make any additional pointed points that you might need to make. Um, I just want to bring two things to mind. I was um, involved with the Rosemont project. I bought the building, I renovated the building, and I brought Rosemont, and I sat at the meetings with Ben and Maureen, and we said, it's been an empty space, it was a non-conforming residential, and we're gonna put in Rosemont, and they said, sure, go for it. 
At no point did they say, wait a second, the deck's changing, it's going to be a handicap lift, and it's a change of use. Because there were changes, changes to the exterior, changes to the use, and at no point did they say, whoa, 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 site plan review. And I spent many nights reading the ordinance. I could probably recite the ordinance word for word. I know everything in that ordinance. And the site plan process for the Cape Town Center is the same as for Shore Road right there. It's exactly the same. And so I was part of that process. So why didn't Rosemont need site plan review, and why do I? And I'm not changing anything to the site. Cumberland Farms changed the site, and Ben approved it. I'm not making changes to the site at all. And, and if the precedent is set that painting and a new roof and repaving the lot triggers site plan review, I don't understand that. I, I've, read, I've, I've read the ordinance, I've followed the rules, I don't want to skirt the rules, but it, it's like giving rules at a game board that you read and everyone understands and then someone says, whoa, 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 I know these rules seem clear to you, but there's actually something else. I, I, I mean, the rules are rules. I've read them, and they're very clear. If you're not changing the site, you're not changing the building, and you go into a less intensive use, you do not need site plan review. Uh, I, I didn't see the asterisks. So um, I, I just don't understand it. It's, I, that's it. I'm just like, I don't understand it. So anyway. Mr. Chairman, I just have one You'll see in the argument, page four, that's been submitted under the second issue, that is the less intensive use. The prior commenter made reference to that, as did Michael. I want to point out that that is a very detailed statutory scheme, 19-6-4E2. It says when we're going from a less intensive use or to a less intensive use by change of use that no site plan review is required. The only way it's been skirted here is because of the removal of the canopies. That's why I emphasize that so much. Mr. Wall concluded that the removal of canopies is a material change which vacates the exemption. I'm, I'm here to say the town center zone change that was referenced by the earlier commenter is the very town center zone change that incorporates 19-6-4E2. What do you have? You already had site plan review for an intensive use. You're going to a much less intensive use. Therefore, ergo, the, the statutory logic and construction is you don't need you fall into an exemption because you don't have the same concerns about traffic, lighting, buffering, etc., drainage. So the concern about modern standards are already dealt with under 19-6-4E2. The question for the board is, does, does the removal of the canopies four years ago by application and issuance of a permit, does that mean that the exemption is voided? I would say that that's patently illogical. I don't, I can't understand it. You know I don't understand it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We will open this up for board consideration, which can certainly include um, questions for the applicant and council. I, I have a question just really tying to that last point. Sure. Um, and, and, and this is partly to Ben also, but if those canopies were there today, would this have just been issued a building permit? And, and you know, assuming that there were no solar panels or classes or anything else, I mean, is this really strictly about the canopies? That seems to be um, Attorney Wall's contention. And I'm just, I'm not clear if there's anything else really at play here. Yeah, if, if, if he was proposing strictly a retail operation with uh, no exterior alterations of the site other than basic maintenance, uh, and the canopies were still there, the parking lot was all the same, if everything was the same, it would not require site plan review. Okay. 
I have a few other random questions, but I'm, I'm happy to defer those. Chair, I have a question for the applicant's attorney. Nope. Yeah, yeah. Have at it, guys. <laughs> Don't wait for me. <laughs> Mr. Bulger, can I have three questions? Perhaps you can elucidate uh, some some issues here. Um, in the paperwork that has been provided, it is not the application for permission to remove the canopies. Are you familiar enough to share some information as to that process and were you involved with that process? The application itself? Is yes. That, is that the question? Yeah. Well, the application is boilerplate that makes reference to well, the, 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 the usual detail the tax map, lot number, the address, the proposed use, et cetera, et cetera. And then, because the, the key question under the um, appeal, and that's, that's what you're making reference to, right? The application for appeal? The application by Cumberland Farms to remove the cannabis. Oh, yes, I have that in my file, but no, I didn't represent Cumberland Farms and I wasn't familiar with that detail. I will tell you there's a lot of information that was reviewed and approved. Yeah. For my thinking, there's a piece of the puzzle missing, and I think that is part of the puzzle. It's, that piece is missing. Uh, because one is that by referring to that application, the, the planning board was aware, and also the code enforcement officer was aware. So that kind of been bolted on to the, the site plan aspect just by uh, approving it. So I'm, I'm missing that authority of the town of going through that process to look at it and say yes or no. The removal of the canopies? Yes. There, the the uh, May 2014 permit, I believe that's the date. But the, their process was simply to apply for it as they would for any demolition permit. So when you look at 1992, um, you know that the parcel of land shall obtain site plan approval prior to any undertaking, alteration, or improvement of the site, including you know, a whole list of acti uh, activities. So my point there is that that suggests that to get approval to have the canopies removed, you would have to satisfy that section. It's raised judicata. The town issues a permit for the removal of that canopy. It is a matter decided in the law. After 30 days, if there's no public comment or no objection or no ADB appeal in the Superior Court, then it cannot be undone. It's legal, it's done, it's finite. And so you would agree that the, at that time, that is the, um... That's given the effect of a judicial decision when the code enforcement officer issues that permit. That's not, that's not my point. Okay. I'm saying at the time of the approval, that is the lay of the land for that lot. Correct. Not the date of the site approval back in 1984. Correct. That yeah. goes into the town's file and everything, just in order to find what I've got in my file, I had to contact Mr. McDougall's office and they do a great job. I, give, I have to give them a lot of credit. I've got everything going back to 1980, I think. <laughs> and uh, there's an incredible amount of detail. But there, in the file, is that permit. Yes. Uh, so my, I have my second question for you. Is, are you able to t talk about the, the, um, the current seller's process and when that person or corporation purchased the property and the thinking as to whether he or she, the, the applicant, needed to go through a site plan review? Well, I can tell you a couple of things. Um, first of all, he was my client, and therefore what I have to say about what his intentions were are confidential. I will say this, he hired Jim Fisher at Northeast Civil Solutions. Jim went through a couple of plans with him. I can say this, I asked him specifically, what is it that you want? Because I'm afraid that you won't be able to resell this property if you ever close on it. It's gonna have all these restrictions. And he, frankly, he wasn't able to tell me specifically. It was maybe a dental office, maybe some fine dining, maybe this, maybe that. And I said, I'm scared to death for you, man, because you don't know 
uh, this property is going to be horribly restricted, and I don't know what your intention is. I don't want to get sued. My, my query <laughs> was then: was this, did the seller originally go through the site plan review process? No. Uh, as on my last query for you is on page 105 of the. Uh, l l let me say this: I think this was. I think he had a plan that was workshopped, but I think, and I don't know. But, Candidly, I haven't represented Jin Wong since he, since he bought the property, effectively. But I know that Jim Fisher had presented various plans. I don't know if they were for buyers who got frustrated and walked away. I've had discussions with Jim about that. I don't know if they were for the seller for his own plans for expansion. Fair question. Um, on page 105 of the code, um, this is under the site plan review section. Um, so paragraph two, where there's a use categories. Could you just identify the category that it's currently at and the category that it will be stepped down to once the new if the applicant gets the I'm going to go off the top of my head, but I think it's uh, category two gas station retail, and it's going to village retail. Gas station convenience store. That would be category six. Going to three. Yeah. While you're looking at this, Ben, is there a, a definition for each of these? Yes. Um, could you, I, I, I should say, I know there is. Could you just point us to the page? Because I, I want to make sure we're talking correctly about village retail shops yeah, since we seem to be. Front. It's in the front here. Okay. The Got it. Thank you. Yes, it's use category six existing gas station and repair garages. And it's going to category um, number three, personal services and village retail shops. Thank you. I'll take over and ask some questions. Um, and I think Matt, I, I, I think I was thinking along similar lines. My, one of my biggest questions is what, what type of permit was issued for removal of the canopies? It was a demolition permit? The question comes from the, from the audience concerning uh, whether we, we need to be debating the existence of canopies in the past, existence of canopies, and, and I guess I'll, I'll, part of our consideration here, ma'am, is to talk about all of these different uh, issues because they're all set forth and addressed within the ordinance. So we'll just continue with our deliberations. Your point is noted, however. And I, I believe there was a question, pending question. The, um, the answer to the question is that the project description is demolition of service station canopy. Um, tax map lot 22, tax map 22, lot 76 at 287 Ocean House Road. It doesn't include any other substantive in information. So. Um, except uh, dig, dig safe was called and it was the end date was May 26, 2014. It was approved May 9th, 14. Sure, and, and thank you.
Okay, so a demolition permit. So, and I think I, I think I caught this in the back and forth between you and, and Matt, but it, there was no site plan amendment granted for removal of the canopies. And, you know, in, in my mind, I reading the ordinance, I think there, there should have been at the time, but did I hear you correctly? Uh, it, you have an opinion that, uh, and I'm not an attorney, so uh, please try to explain it m maybe in uh, non-legal terms, but uh, this demolition permit uh, it means that a site plan amendment uh, was not required after this was granted? When any permit is issued by the town, it's to be given legal effect. It's an appealable decision. Any decision by the code enforcement officer, subsequently by the planning board, they are quasi-judicial bodies. When they issue an opinion, unless it's appealed, which would keep the question open, it becomes race judicata at the end of 30 days. No appeal. It's now a matter decided in the law. It's mm -hmm. irreversible. Does that Is, mean that, that site plan approval, uh, one, one uh, I guess what I'm what I'm wondering is, uh, does that preclude uh, the requirement for uh, an after the facts site plan amendment? Well, let, let me let me frame it a little bit differently. If those canopies were there and Mike was applying for the use, he would leave them there if that w was going to trigger site plan review. He doesn't need them. On the other hand, he doesn't need to take them away. Knowing Michael, he might find a creative use for them. Maybe some swing sets. Um, <laughs> however, you know, what use category being, would that be? Yeah. Being serious, it's you know kind of beyond my pay grade. Honestly, I've never had the question. I've never had some some structure that's been lawfully removed. Now somebody's telling me that I need to go through site plan review with all of its permutations and obligations and everything else, simply because something doesn't exist anymore. I, I, no, I, I, I understand. There, we I, I we run into these questions. things yeah. all the time, these ambiguities all the time, they need to be resolved. But candidly, I, I try to apply logic whenever necessary. In fact, the law court would say, if we don't have a definition, we go to the dictionary. Sure. Uh, some additional questions. Um, were there lights in the canopy? Yes. Yes. So part of the approved, the, the previously approved site plan presumably uh, approved a lighting scheme with lights in the yes. canopy. Um, and are there? Are you aware, or or maybe is is the applicant aware of uh, any other deviations from the approved site plan? Uh, for one, I, I, you know, just looking at it, I, I'm not so sure the landscaping uh, out there today uh, is per the approved site plan. There, there, that's true. My looking at the uh, rendering that was submitted that's in the materials with mm -hmm. the town, that was not enforced against them. I don't know why. But they did not do plantings outside, for example, outside the front door. Right. The plantings that external to the lot, and that lot slopes down quite dramatically. Mm -hmm. The plantings at the perimeter of the lot, in fact, um, were uh, placed, and they are, are all there. You know, I, I drove by it for years, and I really didn't pay any attention. Right. But they're there. Okay. Thank you. Um, this is a question probably more for Ben, but I'm, I'm happy to have your interpretation. I didn't find any expiry for site plan approval in the zoning ordinance. Uh, as far as you know, is there one? No. Okay. Um, I mean, that just goes to, kind of to the question I had that, yes, conditions have changed around the site, but presumably if there had been a site plan approval in 1890, that would be the current site plan approval. Um, on the site, it, it, and it, it that seems a little odd to me, just given obviously certain things in that approval lighting plantings are going to naturally evolve over time, and I'm not sure how, from a common sense perspective, you could ever really look at an old site plan approval and have it be brought current. Um, 
And then I guess, and just sort of thinking about this, and, and I, I know we're harping on the canopies, it is a very, it, it's actually, I think, a very relevant point here. The, I, I guess, the town attorney's contention and, and probably the planning board's contention is any use here would require site plan approval because the canopies are gone. Um, you know, a bank, uh, the, you know, candy shop, oh, I guess that would be competitive with, with Cumberland Farms. But I'm, I'm trying to think, is there, could, can either of you think of any use that, that wouldn't require site plan approval based on, um, based on the attorney's letter, the town attorney's letter? Or would every single thing potentially proposed require it because? Yeah, probably. Okay. okay. Uh, and and under, under, understood. Uh, this is, I mean, look, this, this is to me very tough because, you know, uh, and we'll get to the discussion portion. I think there are very strong arguments on your side. I think there are strong arguments on the town side. It does come down to an interpretation. Um, ultimately, zoning boards of appeal like this are comprised not of judges, but of citizens in the community who interpret what we have in front of us. Um, some of us are lawyers, or some of, collectively us are lawyers, some of us are not. Um, so, you know, I think we, we use our brains and our logic to try to arrive at a solution. And it, it's, you know, I, I think Chairman said this, uh, you know, the, the use itself is tangential to the broader discussion. Um, there are lots of people who like the use. Personally, I like the use, but I, I'm not really factoring that into my mind here. Um, if I may, addressing the point, I am, uh, I practice in front of some boards in different, uh, with different ordinances where they have a level one, level two, and level three site plan review for just this circumstance. If Mike was coming in and he has de minimis changes, we don't have to worry about it. So long as he doesn't have to go through a forty or $50,000 site plan review with drainage calculations and lighting engineers and um, landscape architects, what purpose would it serve here? And so I look at the, I'm looking at, and I already made this point, but I'll say it again. I'm looking at the structure of your overall ordinance, and I'm saying, if I look at site plan review, it is measuring criteria that will not change with what Mike is doing, with what the applicant is doing. We're, we can't measure any of those things in connection with this because he's not changing any of those things. They're not, he's not modifying it. He's going to a substantially less uh, impactful use on that site, which is the logic of the ordinance. Exempt it. Unfortunately, we're not there yet. Sorry, Mr. Bullitt, I have a question for you. Yeah. Chair Rapp, one more question. Um, can you tell us the dates um, when the canopy application was submitted and when the canopies were removed? It has an outside date of May 26, 2014, five years ago. Um, the application was made a couple of weeks earlier. And, uh, there's a copy of it. The reason I'm asking this set of questions is for the public's uh, question earlier is that it really comes down to who has to pay for a site plan. And if just looking at the code, it looks like Cumberland Farm should have paid for one um, to, to get uh, the permit to remove the canopies. Perhaps uh, to sell the property, they should pay for it. I'm sorry, the, the opportunity for public comment is closed. We have to focus on our conversations. So with that's, the, that's the, the way I see it. I may be by myself on this one, but I see there's a, a, a point in time when some a procedure should have been followed. Now, I say that I'm missing some information, um, but you know, it's lawful that they were removed. Now the question is, who should pay for if a site plan is required, who should pay for it? 
and seemed like the applicant's going to be prejudiced because he didn't know at the time that the site plan was going to need, be needed. And now he's come along, he's interested to purchase it. And you know, the town did certain things. You know, it seemed like it was legitimate at the time, and now we're trying to look back over our shoulder, looking for the pieces of the the process when it was followed. Um, so is that the piece of paper that yes. you handed to me? You know, it, it, to your point, if it was a function of saying we want to take those off the site plan, that's not site plan review. That's an eraser on that thing, and we produce a plan that no longer has canopies on it. That's simple. But your only option is full site plan review in Cape Elizabeth, and that's this gorilla process, a Magilla process, whatever, gorilla Magilla process. My point being that it, this is, it either justified in this circumstance or it isn't. There's a logic to it. You're going to a lesser use, less, less intensive use. It says it's exempt. And look, let, me, let me phrase it a little bit differently. If I were going to write the ordinance, why, as, as Mr. McDougall said, everything, if you put a coat of paint on it to change the exterior, it's subject to site plan review. I don't think anybody would say that's really the case. But that was what was suggested. But let's say you're going to put an exterior set of stairs down. Mike says he did it and the town didn't require it. In fact, he went from a two-family to Rosemont and more intensive use wasn't required. Okay, these things happen, I can accept that. But let's say I was gonna write this ordinance. Just, just think about this, you're sitting down and they're gonna tell you to write the ordinance as Mr. McDougal would have it. Wouldn't you just say, there aren't any exemptions, everyone is doing a commercial use, change of use or not, must go through site plan review. What could be simpler? Why would we have a scheme? There's this whole scheme in there. Like, do we ignore it? It's meaningful. It has to be given meaning. It's so clear to me. I just, I, 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 um, I, did, I do this for a living and I have to say it's abundantly clear to me. Point of order. I, I never said a coat of paint required site plan review. I, I clearly stated in the record that Mike could do all the maintenance to the building. He could replace the windows, replace the doors, paint it, replace the roof. None of that triggers site plan review. I acknowledge that, and I, I, I was, it was a rhetorical flourish. Sorry, I just want to, this is another point I just want to make. And if I admit that I say, okay, these canopies are triggering site plan review. Um, if you look at, at the original site plan review, re, site plan for Cumber Farms, there was no canopy. So the original site had no canopy at all. Then they applied for a singular amendment to their existing site plan to add the canopies. So then I went to Maureen and I said, can I apply for a singular amendment to remove the canopies? In which case, I, in my head, I was planning going before the workshop saying, I'd like to apply to remove the canopies that have already been removed. Um, but it says here, so it's 19, it's section 1996B, and it says in there, it says, um, submission requirements may be limited to the information related to the proposed amendment. So my amendment would be to remove the canopies, which is, which is yep. Uh, any planning board decision to approve amendments to a previously approved site plan shall incorporate the original site plan approval, except as specifically amended. So. I could apply for an amendment to the original site plan, so everything would stay the same except for my proposal to remove the canopies. So I guess I could go that route. I could, I could propose an amendment to the existing site plan to remove the canopies. Um, so as you can see, I'm a fairly analytical, logical thinker, and, and I'm reading the code, and, I'm, and I'm, I want to follow the rules of the code. I mean, that's what the code is for. And, uh, and I'm, I'm getting a little mixed up. But uh, I'd be happy to apply for an, a, an amendment to the existing site plan if that would you know, make everything legit. But okay, I just wanted to get that point. Further questions? Uh, yeah. I, I, I would just, sure? can, can, can I make a comment? Yes. I, referencing the 2014 permit, at the time Cumberland Farms came to me, they said we're required by federal law to remove these in order to decommission the gas station. And it, 
and we can't bring anything forward for site plan review because we have nothing to propose. So, you know, the, the canopies are an important part of the site as far as traffic flow, lighting is concerned, but Cumberland Farms, they, they had nothing to propose in place of the canopies, it's gravel. So they said, we're required to comply with federal law to take these down. And, uh, and, and it was understood that, you know, the next use on the property would rectify that issue. That was understood at the time, right, right or wrong, but that's what happened, 2014. Thank you. Any additional questions for the applicant? Hearing none onto our consideration of this. I myself, I know we're talking about the canopies. <laughs> I'm struggling with that particular issue because I, I heard you know, Mike's line of questioning and I have to agree uh, and, and Ben's comments just a moment ago. The canopies, regardless of who took them out and why they were taken out and when they were taken out, they are gone. And that alters traffic flow, that alters parking, that alters lighting. It's a real situation on the ground, it is now a physical condition of the property that is not accounted for in the current site plan. Um, so I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with that uh, as far as how, how best to deal with that. But that's. I, I, I struggle with that too, obviously. Um, I mean, I do come out, I think, thinking if we're struggling about canopies, that's. It's not, I feel like it's not maybe de minimis in terms of the site, but it's really de minimis to me in the overall context of what's going on. Um, I, I mean, I, I can't, I, can't I, I struggle to find why canopies would make the site better. If the canopies were there, we wouldn't be here. The building permit would have been issued and, and Mr. Freeland would be on his way. And it doesn't particularly beautify the site. It doesn't add anything in my mind in the context of circulation as it relates to this lesser use. And I come back to, um, and, and this was kind of where I started, if the zoning ordinance did not include specifically in the town center lessening the use and not having to go through site plan approval, I think we'd be done with this long ago. Um, but it does. It, it, it's almost as if the writers of the zoning ordinance said, you know what, there's gonna be changes in what happens in the town center over time. We're creating a living document. Uh, and, you know, if things get more intensive, yeah, we gotta talk about that. If things stay the same, yeah, we gotta talk about that. If you're gonna do anything strange to the property, altering it, changing what the building looks like, then we're gonna talk to it. But you know what, if you're gonna keep the same building, and just downgrade the use, we don't want to impose extra on people just for that. And I, <laughs> so that, that's what I struggle with um, on this because I think the, the intent of the document does not call for site plan approval. However, we generally should, I think, encourage site plan approval because as a public policy matter, it, it builds a better environment. Um, uh, you know, you could have your solar panels. I, I'd love for my kid to be able to take woodworking classes. I, I think it creates a better function, uh, but it costs money. So th those are, to me, the, the arguments, uh, you know, that I have on both sides. And I, I just, I, I can't for the life of me get hung up on canopies and the fact that if those were there, we wouldn't be here. Uh, yeah, so uh, I've lived in town for, um, geez, I don't know, 12, 13 years, something like that. So, I, I, you know, I remember when Cumberland Farms was there. And, um, you know, thinking back to that site, if you were to look at that site uh, 10 years ago and ask someone, what are the dominant, dominant features of this site? I think... 
almost everyone would say, sure, the building and the three giant <laughs> fuel islands and canopies that cover much of the parking lot. The dominant site feature. Those are approved in a site plan approval, reviewed and approved by the planning board. Uh, and yes, they were removed. Uh, in my mind, they, it should have received site plan approval, uh, site plan amendment for that removal. And, uh, and now someone wants to come along and use the site uh, under the existing site plan approval. Uh, but the, to me, perhaps the most visible dominant feature of the site is no longer there. So, uh, to me, I think it's pretty simple. I think it, I think it needs a site plan amendment. Uh, I agree with the, the interpretation of Mr. Uh, Friedland, Friedland's uh, perhaps last point on the amendment process. I think if the canopies are the only thing changing, then hopefully that's the only thing the planning board will consider. Hopefully, and, and, and we, don't, we don't do site plan reviews, um, so that's you know to the planning board, but uh, you know clearly stormwater drainage is not changing. So uh, you know I, I'm hoping you wouldn't have to to spend the money to look at that. I'm sensitive to the, the cost of uh, putting together an application um, and you know hiring uh, professionals to, to go through that process, um, but I think that process is important for the town. Um, I think there's it, there's a purpose for it. Um, and uh, I, think, I think this project, your project, which I, I think will be a, a great addition to town and I hope it, I hope it works, but I, I think it would be appropriate to, to have site plan amendment. We'll see, we were talking a lot about, uh, we brought a cost of site plan um, review quite a bit here tonight and worrying about how that might impact the, the current project. Um, as a note, you're in your due diligence phase of uh, this, this transaction. Um, it's not your fault this was done five years ago, 10 years ago. Um, apparently it wasn't the current seller's fault either, but that seller bought the property from, the, from Cumberland Farms with conditioning the way he bought it. Um, you shouldn't have to buy it that way. Um, you should probably oh, Think about getting somehow instead of you paying for it, and so the town being affected by not going to the correct process, perhaps the the current seller could take care of that. No. <laughs> if 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 this property is as as problematic as Attorney Bulger says it is, then. <laughs> just have a couple of brief comments. I'm really in trouble that um, an opportunity was uh, in the code sending out that if there's going to be change the, the site, you need a new site plan approval. Um, a gap happened. Uh, apparently that, that did not happen. Um, a application to remove the you know, canopies was permitted. And so now, years later, um, there's prejudice to a potential buyer of the lot. Mm -hmm. And, you know, on the one hand, you know, the town can, you know, should not be necessarily using part of the code as a defense here, because they, they essentially it's an estoppel argument, equity. And there's, there's a sense of fairness here. So I get the policy as to why we should have a site plan approval, I get it. Um, you know, and, and is this the type of application that we'll see you know, again? I hope not, because, you know, if people do what they're supposed to be doing and they follow the, the, the letter of the code, uh, and that there's communication between the various parts of the town, there should be a one-off. That said, I don't want to create a precedent. So I too am troubled. I'm, I'm curious, Ben, on, on you probably didn't expect to be questioned on your letter of determination. Um, you hereby determine that your proposed use requires site plan approval from the planning board. Would a site plan amendment suffice? 
in, I, I'm not putting you on the spot here and you, and you may not feel like answering this moment, but I, is that is that an option? Yes. And is that something that the, the current owner would do? Something that, I mean, it, it, Mr. Fridland has obviously interest in it as the contract holder. Would it be something he does and, and could it be strictly linked to effectively current conditions? Well, anyone with an interest in the property can file for site plan review. It would all be at the discretion of the planning board. Yep. I'm just, uh, I'm wondering out loud uh, if there's, <laughs> I, I don't like the splitting the baby argument, but if there's a way that, that we can find that a site plan amendment is required, but site plan approval is not. Uh, I don't think we can. Yeah, I, I think that's, I like, where you, I like your thinking, but that's the, per, that's the exclusive purview and discretion uh, of the planning board. Understood. I use the term site plan approval kind of as an umbrella with a site plan amendment being a type of a, a site, site plan, plan approval. approval. Got, gotcha. Yep. I just wanted to have it in the record that section 1996 on dealing with amendments, I'll just read the first two sentences. Any alteration to a site which is inconsistent with the approved site plan shall require an amendment to the site plan. Planning board approval must be obtained prior to alteration. That's pretty strong. Okay. How do we... Uh, how do we undo history to say that you know something that did not happen the way it's supposed to happen here? Hmm. Well, I... it seems like it was someone else's mistake. And unfortunately, even if we found it as a de minimis change, there is a procedure for that here as well. So I don't know that that's an after the fact decision that that makes sense. Matt, what was that section again? 1996, page 277. I just wanted to move over to um, another paragraph, subparagraph B in 278. And this is this is uh, semantics because um, any change to a plan approved by the planning board must be submitted to the planning board for review and approval unless the amendment is a de minimis, de minimis, a de minimis change. So the, the issue is the, the uh, permission to remove the canopies apparently would not submit it through this process. Or if it was, the, the, the planning board perceived it as a de minimis change. I don't know that I don't know that we can I don't think that happened I don't think we can make that leap there's a process yeah. outlined in 19 dash 6 19 sorry 1996 a and I, I think it's pretty clear that that didn't happen Let me ask you, let me ask a rhetorical question here. If, if Cumberland Farms changed their mind, re removed those canopies, changed their mind and said, we want, you know what, we want to reopen on this site, but we don't want to put the canopies back, would that require a site plan amendment? Of course it would. They would need a building permit, <laughs> and that would reawaken what was on the site now. Mm -hmm. They would need to bring the property into compliance yeah. with the existing site plan. Even if they didn't want to put a gas station there, even if they just wanted to open the building as their convenience store, reopen it, it would still trigger site plan approval. Uh, no, because 
the deed to change, right? And so it would well, be some other purpose, some other use. Right, right. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it, it, even if they opened a village retail shop, um, the this, this strict act of applying for any type of permit would trigger site plan approval. And I, 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 I just, I don't think, looking at this, that wasn't the intent. And, and I do have a problem with that because I think we can interpret intent in this and I do think the intent's pretty clear. Um, but also, I mean, to your point, Matt, I mean, it, two wrongs don't make a right. So just because this wasn't done right doesn't mean, I think, you know, we necessarily should say, well, you know, this wasn't done right, so we'll do something else that's not right. Um, I, I, I view our charge here as, I think I pointed this out before, is ordinary citizens interpreting a document and interpreting history that wasn't necessarily in line with this document to the best of our abilities. Um, I don't, you know, I, I, I probably disagree with, with Mike here on the, the canopies. I, I don't view them as material in the entire scope of the greater approval. Yes, they were big and you could see them and they had lighting in them and that was good if you were pumping gas. Uh, but when you're downgrading the use of the property, uh, you know, if this were a, 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 any type of village retail shop, you wouldn't need lighted canopies um, to, to operate that. So, and you have a parking lot, you don't have traffic moving through reaching gas pumps. Uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, that, that's, I, I, you know, I, I, I think I am leaning toward the side of, of not necessarily agreeing with Attorney Wall's um, interpretation of this. I would like, I, I like site plan approval, I really do. I think it's ultimately beneficial to the community. Uh, my interpretation of the code is it's not required here. And uh, I will take the, the opposite side of the spectrum and, and I understand completely where you're coming from. I get it. Uh, if we're just sitting here as, as reasonable people debating the merits of whether this really should have to go through this process. And I, we may end up in the same camp, but when I look at the, at the language based on the fact that we do have exterior alterations that do not comply with the existing site plan, I, that controls to me, in my mind, that, that strict plain language. Um, when you say exterior alterations, are you talking about the proposed alterations in the building permit or the removal, the, the previous alterations, if you the will? The previous alterations. I, I, I fully understand With that interpretation. I think, you know, we disagree. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I understand, I understand. and, and uh, to, to, to Matt's point, you look back to 1996 and the alteration to a site which is inconsistent with the approved site plan shall require an amendment to the, to the site plan. It does not say who caused the alteration. Um, and I completely understand Mr. Friedland's point that, uh, that he, he, didn't, he didn't do it. Uh, but regardless, it is a, a, an alteration to the site inconsistent with the approved site plan. Chair, just a point of order there. To get the demolition plan, you need an amendment to the site plan uh, approval first. There was no amendment. So you don't get the demolition. <laughs> but you're holding it in your hand. So, <laughs> right, so we, we, the way you were describing it is that someone is responsible. Well, I don't want to use the word responsible, but there's a, a chronology of acts that should occur. And we cannot hit the rewind button, unfortunately, as much as I wish we could. That, so that's, again, that's, that's my take on it. Um, it sounds like, yes. That's where I'm getting hung up. Is yeah. The town issued a permit to bring down the canopies. The town had to have known that that's a, an approved plan, that's a commercial right in the middle of the city. Whether or not it's done properly or not doesn't matter, but it's almost like the town owns it now. They issued it, conditions on the ground are they are, as they are for five years. I mean, it's a sticky wicket. 
and there, there may well be a legal argument for Attorney Bulger to make at that on, on that point. Yeah, yeah I hear you. It's, I hear you. The town has given their consent and approval for removal. It just seems logical, to me, and I think the point was already made, but I'll say it again. At the time the code enforcement officer has that decision to make, the implication of him not requiring a site amendment is that this was a de minimis, de minimis change in his view. And those are big canopies. When you're decommissioning though, it's not part of a function. So I can certainly understand the interpretation on his part that it was de minimis, de minimis change and you're going to allow it. What happens with de minimis, de minimis change? It is exempt. There is no site plan amendment. There's no site plan review. And hence, what we have is conflated in one decision is something as Matthew said, Mr. Caton said, we gotta give this a stopple effect. We got all kinds of, 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 of legal concepts at play here, but one thing is it's fundamentally unfair to charge him with the notice of what should have happened in the code enforcement office. I can like what the code enforcement officer did with respect to those canopies. No site plan amendment required, none, none of our town resources, they're coming down, thank God. Okay, so that's my point. We have, an, you can give a stopple effect, that's, that's, com, that's logically compelling. I stated earlier, it's raised judicata, same thing. It's done four years ago. What's done is done is done. We have to reorder our affairs and move on. Is there a mistake? It wasn't his mistake. I don't think it was a mistake. I think it was a de minimis change. I, 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 I think I've pretty, come up pretty clearly saying that I probably am supportive of overturning the decision, but I actually disagree with that. I, I don't, I, from everything I've heard, I, I, don't, I don't view it as a, um, as that's what the town uh, you know, did here. And, and by the way, I, before we even get on uh, too much more, I did want to say this is probably the most complete and thorough analysis that I've seen of anything here. So I, I do want to thank um, both of you uh, for for that, and and also to thank Ben for really being you know a, a resource here and framing kind of the history of everything. It's it's extraordinarily helpful. Um, but no, I, I don't I don't really agree with that the town thought it was de minimis at the time. I think it was an oversight. Oversights happen, we're human. And I don't disagree that it's unfair to your client. Um, he's the one sitting here and uh, it, it could have been somebody else under contract, it could have been your previous client who would have been sitting here saying, I just want to open a dental office, why do I need canopies in my parking lot? Um, and I think that's strange logic as well. So, uh, you know, if a, a real estate agent wanted to open an office here to have one on all four corners just to make sure, you know, we were covered, um, would canopies be, you know, a, a necessary uh, thing for that? I, uh, I think that's the planning board's decision. That's not our, that's not our call. Uh, Chair, can I have a point of order? Would you accept um, Attorney Bulger's comments? It was, we had closed discussion to the executive session. So he addressed, so if this on appeal, do you want his testimony that he just talked about to be on the record or not? Oh, I don't know. I hadn't thought much about it, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, that's up to the board, I suppose. I mean, I, it, it is part of the, it is now part of the record, I guess I would say. It's, Well, we need to make a decision on this. Um, I think while I am not hearing a consensus, I think I'm, I'm hearing the beginnings of a majority. So I'm gonna propose a motion and we'll see where it goes. Uh, and the motion is to deny the administrative appeal of the MEMs LLC, Michael Friedland manager, regarding the code enforcement officer's determination that his proposal for the property at 287 Ocean House Road, map U22, lot 76, requires a site plan review from the planning board prior to receiving other permits and commencing operation. Is 
anybody interested in forwarding that motion that as a motion so moved okay. do we have a second i'll second okay um we're on to further discussion then i know th i agree this is a it's a close call it's a difficult call um i've I think already articulated my reasons for supporting the motion, and, and um, uh, that's where I continue to, to stand on it. As much as I don't necessarily like it, uh, I feel obligated to to strictly um, comport with, abide by the language of the ordinance, and that's what I think I'm doing with my position. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I agree with you, and I, I think I've. Uh, explained my position on this uh, pretty clearly already. I just want to say I, 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 I'm looking forward to the business opening here after site plan review. Um, Agreed. I think it'll be a great business. I'm looking forward to it. Um, and I would like just to go back to my point earlier about the contract. It's, it's not the applicant's property right now, and this problem that we've identified runs with the profits with the property. It's not with this applicant. And I think we touched upon earlier that any, I think Ben said that basically anything, we kind of asked him, well, what would trigger this? Everything in there. So that's everything. That is a burden on the property. And that's up to the applicant to figure that out with the owner, but it's not the board's and not the town's issue. Um, it can be fixed. Agreed. I, I agree with a lot of um, you know what Aaron said, but I, I, I come down on I just I, I, I can't get on board with every single thing requiring you know a full site plan uh, approval process. I would hope that the planning board would be receptive to a simple amendment um, regarding removal of the canopies. That's not something we have any ability uh, to do, but. Um, you obviously have a lot of support in the community, and and that is the type of thing that the planning board should take into account uh, if you or the seller uh, were to file a, a site plan amendment. So um, I will not support the the motion, but I, I certainly respect uh, the position. I, I I believe that we do have the ability to interpret uh, the zoning ordinance and to interpret the intent and to interpret the conditions on the site. Um, maybe a little more broadly, and you know, I, I don't plan on becoming a Supreme Court justice <laughs> uh, based on that. Um, but that's that's where I fall on this. Any further comments before we vote on the motion? All right, we'll move on to the vote. All then in favor of uh, the motion, which is to deny the administrative appeal. All opposed. So we've got a tie vote, which I think means the, I'm not sure of this. I think the determination stands. The staff determination then stands, I believe. You want me to answer that? <laughs> if you know. In your opinion, <laughs> does the staff determination stay? Can you propose the opposite motion? It's going to be 3-3. Three, three. Well, uh, I mean, I'll happily the, move to. No, there's, there's no sense. Yeah, there's no sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think so it comes down the same way. We voted. It's the Zoning Board of Appeals manual says you need a majority of the board to carry an application forward. Okay. Or any motion forward. Right, so so I think that I think that then means the staff determination stands. Yes, you, yeah. I mean you could reverse yeah. you could reverse the vote and vote to grant the administrative appeal, and the vote would be three three and same result. Same result. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm not quite sure what that does with our findings of fact. <laughs> Then, you do not, may I suggest that you don't have any findings of fact other than the that, other than the, the result of the vote, the which, of the motion, that the motion, yeah. Yeah. unless you want to withdraw that motion and vote and then try something else. 
<laughs> I think we're up against it. I think we've. Uh... I, I'm gonna. I'd be. I'd have a tough time changing my mind on this. So no, I'm... no, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. I mean, it is what it is. Um, this is this is the democratic process in action. <laughs> um. Yeah, so I think it, I think uh, I think we're done then, right? I don't think there are any any findings that we adopt. I, yeah, it's, I, I don't know if we should uh, get town council's opinion on the findings, but uh, no, I know, but we're not going to come to an agreement on the findings. We couldn't come to an agreement on the underlying motion. Yeah. So there's no sense. The only the only thought would be if we wanted to table discussion on the findings to get council's opinion, if that's something anybody thought was worthwhile. I don't know that I necessarily do. I don't feel like spending our tax dollars <laughs> on it. Um, yeah, no, I think I, I think I think we have uh, voted on the on the uh, pending application. I think that concludes it. If there is, see, now I need to find my agenda here. Assuming I can find that, I think that was the end of the line. Yep. Yes, that concludes our meeting this evening, Tuesday, April 23rd. Thank you all for your participation. We are adjourned.